Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my blog. Today I would like to begin a new three-part series called Space, Time, Movement, and Healing. And we will look at each one of those in successive blogs. Today we're going to begin with Space, then we'll go to Time, then we'll finish with Movement. Now, to begin the presentation, I would first like to give you the dictionary definition of what space is. Then I'd like to explain a couple of things that we will keep on the blackboard throughout the series because they relate to pretty much everything in life, <laughs> that's why. And then I will take you through an exploration of the concept of space in our life as it relates to both healing and uh, our creativity and having the space and the inner space to live our dream or our goals or objectives, whatever is important to us that uh, inspires us to pay attention and create what we need in order to fulfill ourselves and nourish our soul, which is really uh, to nourish the soul usually equates to to create something that has meaning for us, something that is meaning-making, uh, which is an important point. If you're trying to figure out what your dream is and you're not sure what your dream is, one way to investigate that is to ask yourself, what is meaning-making for you? What is it that is meaningful in the world that you would like to contribute to or it is meaningful, you, meaningful for you to share either with yourself or with others, or both would be a natural result. So let's begin with an exposition, I mean a, de a description of what space is. Space is a continuous area that is free, available, or unoccupied. So we'll be looking at space as it relates to several different aspects of ourselves because we are more than just physical beings, therefore we have to consider space from more than just a physical perspective. Now, here we can see that I've got the word zero, which is the equivalent of unconditional love, and that is also the source of pure potential, or the absolute out of which everything relative emerges, so all things that can be known, perceived, counted, or experienced are acts of the relative, with very few exceptions, and therefore we want to look at the fact that in order for us to have the experience we call life, we have to have space, we have to have time, and we have to have movement, and it turns out that in most instances space and time and movement are all expressions of each other. So in some way there's almost always a correlation between space and time, and space, time, and movement. So as we're going through the series, know that though I've broken these things up into chunks, at the end you should be able to see that space, time, and movement all mirror some aspect of each other for better or as a means of challenges that produce discomfort, pain, or awareness in our lives. Now. At the top of my symbols you see the dotted circle. The dotted circle is something that represents something that's there but not there, or it's there but you cannot see it. For example, in drafting, if you're showing a picture of what's behind the wall, you would use dotted lines so that you reading the plans can see there's more to it than you can see with the naked eye. What's behind the appearances is really the issue. This in Taoist philosophy stands for Wu Qi. Wu means not. Qi means love or life force. So if everything that is created is made of Tai Chi or love or life force or the two relative polarities of male and female, that would create the object that we call the universe. And in order for there to be a perceptible object, there has to be a subject. In other words, if you're listening to me right now, I'm the object, but what's inside of you listening is the relative subject. 
So when it comes to space, time, and movement, those would be things that have to be expressed in the Tai Chi symbol. Therefore, behind it, there must be the equivalent of pure subject, or if this is being, then this would be non-being. Subject, object, non-being, being. So here we have unbound space. In quantum physics or quantum information processing, they break space into two basic categories. Unbound space, which is the realm of non-locality, the home of things like archetypes, and we know this is a real space because there are many, many studies looking at non-local information transfer all the way from the effect of electrons on each other to distant healing and uh, telepathy and many various forms of action at a distance. And these things, though, aren't, though they're not really well appreciated in the mainstream, they are actually very, very well studied. It's just that most people are still fairly narrow in their appreciation for what science has objectively identified. And then, of course, we have what's called scientific materialism, which does its best to limit people's awareness of what's really known. So these are all important things to consider. Now, from here, the first step down is we have essentially a field of action. In other words, in other words you couldn't have the Tai Chi symbol if the circle wasn't there because the male and female, or excuse me, female and male would have no field of action. If you want to make love to someone, you need a place to do it, whether it be a car, a bed, a tent, uh, you know, somewhere. There has to be, if there's bodies, there has to be a field of action. So the soul is represented as the circle. The circle represents the feminine or the receptive, remember yin, is the feminine energy that means the emptiness. So a vagina is empty, therefore it's yin. A penis is full, it has mass, therefore it is yang. It fills space and the male and the female complement each other. Though they are relative opposites, the dot in the center, if you've seen a rock stack like I put on my blogs, that represents the phallic symbol or the male energies. And then the circle that you see often around stone stacks represents the female or the receptive field of action. In the circle of the soul, the dot in the middle represents the point of origin or the beginning, which represents I. So that which is aware of itself is represented by the dot in the middle or the masculine polarity, that which is projected into being and the field around it is the feminine principle of receptivity, openness, and possibility for expression, movement, change, etc. In the individual, the ego has its own unique thoughts, feelings, desires, emotions, and acts of will. Therefore, the Tai Chi symbol says there's always a relationship to how much you're projecting, outputting, or creating within the field of possibility. And the bigger the yang expression gets, the more furniture you have in your house, the less space you have for activities, things, change, or other possibilities. Because in relational space, which is down here, so first we talked about unbound space up here, down here we have what's called bound space or relational space. The Tai Chi symbol recognizes relational space. If you have a male, you must have a female, and if you have a female, there must be a male. Those two cannot exist without each other, and, and that is the grand scheme of things. I'm not talking about males and, as in the male species. I'm talking about the explicate or that which is embodied as anything from rock to atom to molecule to tree, plant, stone, planet, star, person, you name it. So here we always have a relationship. Something is in relationship to another thing. 
It's important to realize this because, as I'll get into in a minute, here is where our ego spends most of its time and projects most of its awareness, but it gets so trapped in the physical realm that it forgets that within the soul there is actual emptiness and room for intuition. This is the field of intuition. It's open because the soul, you could say, is the receiver of ideas or experiences, but is not the idea or experience itself, just as Wu Qi expressed as Tai Chi, even though it is expressing it because it's non-local, you can't identify it as the thing or the experience itself. But we know through scientific and meditative investigations that what's behind everything is no thing. This symbol also means mind. That symbol there is the source of no mind. So this would be empty awareness or this would be the state one is in when they have a samadhi or uh, you know, a nirvana experience would be to be completely extinguished and even lose self-identity as soul. So there, these symbols have important meaning to the understanding of space, time, and movement because they're the actual source of everything that we perceive or can perceive as mind, as emotion, or as body. So just a quick review, yin is the empty, yang is that which is occupied or projected, yang is that which is explicate or the seed unfolding, yin is the infolding or the source of, for example, when you zip a, a, a file so it's easier to email to someone, you take what was a big file, explicate, and you zip it down into a seed form so that would be to implicate the file, which would be to put it into lesser space. Or if you go to the highest level of zipping, you go all the way up to Wu Qi Zero or Unconditional Love, where everything in the created universe has its seed form. So the entire universe and all in it is zipped down to zero. Now that's pretty good zipping. Maybe the computer systems will get there one day. Okay, so now that we understand that all things in the created realm have a relationship between space, time, and movement, including us. And there's a physical relationship, an emotional relationship, and a mental relationship, because those all represent different levels of, shall we say, energetic entanglement. Your physical body's very tangible. You can't just easily get rid of it. Emotions are higher vibrational energies. They're tangible, you feel them, but it's easier to change your emotions in general than it is to, say, transform your body. And then your mind is a higher vibrational energy, and we know thoughts move in and out like wild uh, fireflies, so the energy is even higher, it's more volatile, but it's actually easier to make changes, so we must remember that creation unfolds in three stages. First, there's a thought, then there's word, which you could say is the, the vibration of expressing yourself, which we could also equate to the emotional experience because when we use words, we're expressing our emotions. And then there's the deed or the action which takes place in your life at the physical level. So thoughts, highest vibration, words, next level, deeds down here in the physical realm. So, to begin our exploration of space and how it relates to healing, in my one, two, three, four approach, which is my formula for how things work in life and how we make changes in life, you'll notice over here, for example, that you've got three coordinates, space, time, and movement, but zero is not a coordinate, it's a potential. So there's always a fourth available to us, and that fourth is choice. That is why we have free will. We can choose to or not to change spatial relationships in our life. And if we um, fail to choose, then we are choosing not to choose, so we still have free will. So question one is, number one, what is your dream? So we always have to look at what is it that I 
choose to create from moment to moment with my thoughts, my words, and my deeds? And is it moving me in the right direction? And if I'm meeting resistance in the creation of my dream, is it a labor of love? In other words, a natural challenge of process, something that I need to work through, such as maybe you're living in a space that's too small and confining for you right now, but it's motivating you to make a change to something that's more suitable to creating the inner and exterior, internal and external space that, it, that facilitates your creativity and your natural flow. So once you know what your dream is, you can begin to ask yourself, what are my mental space needs? So when we see mental space and then emotional space, thoughts trigger emotions and emotions trigger thoughts. In fact, if you look at the book Infinite Mind by Valerie Hunt, she shows you that the emotional field is so strong, it can easily commandeer the mind. So if a person doesn't have enough emotional space, it can compress their mental space to the point where they're trapped in one repetitive thought or feeling or thought feeling. So these two are very much, shall we say, like uh, two people tied together in a three-legged race. <laughs> one can't run any faster than the other and one can't move without the other one knowing it. So if we go down here, you see that I've drawn a picture with a person and I've got the word social matrix. Human beings are social creatures. We cannot effectively grow and develop without relationships. The whole human ego is really a collection of ideas that have emerged out of relationships. And when we're in a, when we are social creatures, we kind of come into a paradox. We need each other to grow in relationships and without relationships, we can't experience love. But if we get too much of our sense of self by being in relationship to other people, and we have too many people around us, we can start feeling that our mental, emotional, and physical space is being infringed upon, which triggers a stress reaction, which leads to increases in adrenaline, elevations in blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate, activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight system, externalizes your life force, and elevates glucocorticoids, which prepare the body to fight, to run, or to engage, but if that state stays up too long, then we cannot return from that relative yang fight flight state back into a yin growth, repair, regenerate, and recovery state. So anytime we're dealing with challenges with space, time, or movement that are stopping us from our natural creative flow and being connected to ourself, there's a stress response and you could say pretty much 99% of all diseases, you could put maybe 97% in there if you wanted to just go right to hardcore genetics, but then we still have to consider epigenetic influences. But just to be safe, I'll say 97% of all the diseases and illnesses and the chronic fatigue that we're suffering from has to do with pushing ourselves into relationships with self and other that cramp our ability to use space, time, and movement in ways that are nourishing to us, which are growth opportunities. So here you see my circle. The circle, again, is a field of action. The soul is a field of action. You are in the center of your own circle at all times. We're always the center of our own universe. So when it comes to personal space, we have to say, well, what's going on in my interior? Uh, you know, an example of this is I had to move away from the Institute office and put my own office here up on top of a mountain in a beautiful environment where I had not only more space around me, but less people around me, which turns out to give me more space inside of me to process the thoughts feelings, emotions, and things that I need to process to not only develop educational materials, blogs, books, audios, videos, but to work in a quiet space 
where I can help other people process the challenges of their life. And most of the people that see me come because they have some kind of significant challenge or challenges. So I am sharing with you that having been through this many times myself, I became aware of what I really needed, but I had to get aware of it inside of myself before I could deal with what I should do in the external space around me. So the point that I'm making is all of us has to decide based on what our dream is, how much mental space do we need? How much of our thinking is unproductive and is actually really a stress reaction? It's just like hot water that is agitated from heat and boils. But when your mind and your emotions are in that agitated state, you can't effectively channel them into a focus because everything's bouncing around everywhere, which is why gases escape the bowl. They're agitated to the point they lift right off and become atmosphere. And so when we know what we need in our relationship to self and others to achieve our dreams, we can only get to that point by being in ourselves and being clear with ourselves. Then we have our exterior space. Now, the exterior space relates to, in this case, a social matrix. Who are the people around me? So just for fun, if I start putting, if you say, okay, I'm sitting somewhere all by myself, maybe at a, at a park, because you want to go out and do some meditation or something, or sitting in your living room watching a show that you really wanted to watch, it's the end of the day, and you just want to do something relaxing and mindless, or you're trying to do some homework to get a task or an assignment done. So the question I have is, if you look at this nice open space and see yourself in it, and just say, how would I feel if that was me in that space right now? So just look at the image, connect to it, and see what you feel like, what happens to you when you're aware of your inner space. Now, pay close attention to what happens inside of you as I start adding other people. So now you got the monkey on your back. <laughs> then we put another person in there. And you'll notice that the energy in this space is starting to change. I'm feeling pressure right here in my abdomen, personally. We'll put another person in there. And then we see how that feels. And then we maybe put a kid on the floor. And throw in another little person. And another one. And another one. And another one. So now when you put yourself in that circle, how does it feel with regard to your ability to keep your mind focused? How does it feel when you think of that many people talking and re interacting and giggling and goofing off or whatever, they, or, or expressing negative emotion? What happens if this was you at the park and you went there to meditate and all of a sudden all these people show up to throw frisbees around or kick soccer balls around? You might notice that you start getting a stress reaction and even a simple exercise like this can be very powerful because you can create a symbol inside of yourself by creating a symbol on the paper. So if you say, how much space do I need in relationship Draw a circle like that and put yourself in the center and then begin adding people that are important to you as it relates to your dream or your core family and say, when it comes to living my dream, I'm going to add maybe my spouse or my child and then see how you feel inside and notice that if you put them at different locations in the circle, it'll have a different effect on you, which also is important because it tells you relative closeness that you function best with that person. And then a, one that usually triggers a reaction in most people is put your stepmother 
in there. And you can also create icons, just cut a little symbol out of a piece of cardboard, and then you can move them around so you then put your mother-in-law in there. And you see, where does she feel best relative to me in that circle? And then you'll leave her where she feels best, and then you can do your father, your father-in-law, etc. And you will find that not only can you feel where each of these people belongs relative to you, but it gives you an approximate distance that you need to have them in as a general theme. In other words, do you want them living in your house or is it better to have them at the edge of your circle? Now I could tell you much more about this, but it would take too long. This is a shamanic healing exercise actually, uh, called it, sometimes referred to as a family matrix but, or a social matrix. So the point that I'm making here, just to summarize, is that you must first identify what you need on the inside and get clear. And only then when you have that reference point can you really effectively go into adding these other relationships or you really won't know what ideal is. You'll, you'll kind of be like a little kid that just focuses so much on what's right in front of them that they don't even notice that everybody around them is making all this noise. But by the time you're old enough to watch this video, you probably have some level of obligation to yourself and other people, responsibilities, money that has to be made, things that have to be paid for. So we can't live in the world of a child where they uh, oftentimes enjoy distractions, where as an adult those distractions become not so entertaining or educational, but frustrating, okay? So we now look at what are my mental and emotional space needs. Then we gotta go to physical space needs. Physical space needs can be what do you need in your office? What do you need in your home? Many of the times when people come to see me for help, especially in my old office because I was up on the second floor in of my office and I could see right down into people's cars in the parking lot, one of the first things I want to know when someone pulls into my office for healing work is what does their car look like inside? And lo and behold, I can tell you that probably about 95% of the people that come to see me who I find on investigation have emotional lives that are very cluttered, mental lives that are very cluttered, and often even homes that are very cluttered, is that their car and the way they keep their car on the inside and the outside and the way they maintain it is often a pretty reliable expression of how they manage spatial relationships in general. So sometimes one of the first things that we can do to create more physical space is simply clean our physical space and organize things in ways that make it easier for us to do what we want to do. In other words, you, for example, this represents a studio apartment, but if you need to sit here at the table and do your thinking work, your homework, your studies, your business planning, whatever, but there's three people in the family and the TV's blaring and the kids playing, you may find that that actually creates a barrier and you may actually find, like Einstein did, that if you go in the bathroom, close the door and fill the hot tub up with some hot water and get yourself one of those little uh, uh, tub tables like my wife has, she sits and reads her books in the bathtub because she loves to be in that quiet space, you could actually be 10 times more productive in the tub with a little bit of incense, your favorite music, and the door shut, and you will realize that you've got 10 times more work done in an hour than you ever could have got done sitting at that table. So the other thing is, is when it comes to physical space needs, there's also a significant cultural influence. Somebody from Japan or from China, I don't know if you've ever seen those cities, they have tiny hotel rooms, they got train cars that, uh, and tram cars that are just so packed with people you couldn't even breathe. If you cut a fart in that thing, everyone in the whole car has to deal with it. So those people could actually deal with a confined space much more um, positively than we could in our Western culture because they're used to being in confined spaces and they were raised in them. So for them, it's quite normal. But when you look at the size of American cars or American houses or even European homes, houses and cars, it's a completely different cultural experience. So we have to, we have to remember that different 
cultural backgrounds create a different context of relativity within our perceptual sense of what is crowded and what isn't crowded. To do an experiment here, let's just say that this is you sitting here doing homework or working on something important at the table. So here you are right here. Now what I'd like to share with you is let's see what happens if we make the room smaller. So if we move the couch a little closer to you and we move the bed a little closer and we move the bathroom a little closer and we move the walls a little closer if you're paying attention, just feel what's happening inside of yourself and you might notice you're getting a feeling of compression and that what is spatial compression because it's interpreted through the thoughts and emotions actually becomes has a correlate mental emotional compression. And I'm, maybe you've been in a situation where you've been in an argument or you've been working on something and it's you're feeling stressed and you say, I need to get outside. So you get up and you go for a walk and all of a sudden you feel less stressed because you're now opening your physical environment which opens your emotional and mental body. You could say you have more sky. Sky is space to move in. So lo and behold, we bring that bed a little closer, we bring the wall a little closer, we bring the couch a little closer, and we bring that wall a little closer and pretty soon you find yourself, now if you were Japanese, this might just now start looking like your home or it, it could be fairly normal for you. In fact, you might feel like you're wasting space in a typical Western home or apartment and it might be stressful to you. You might even think, oh my God, I've got to clean all this stuff all the time. It's too much. So the key thing is what do you need? Well. If we did the same exercise here and we started adding people into this space, you would quickly find that there's a relative relationship between how many people you can hand in your personal space and your physical space because every person occupies physical space. So there, these are very, very real issues and many of us get frustrated because we're not able to create what we want effectively and find ourselves drinking coffee and tea and doing drugs and all sorts of things to try to cope with the stress without realizing maybe what we need to do is create more space in our life to be the person we choose to be and do the things that we need to do. And that's why I told you in the beginning, I had to move my entire office to an environment that was conducive for me because I knew if I didn't, I couldn't honor my needs in order to support other people and we can't escape the thing called relationships. Okay, so we've now looked at mental space, emotional space, physical space. I've talked about a social matrix which includes your interior space and your exterior space. Now what I'd like to do is go to this zone here which is a, a meant to be a daily schedule. We're going to talk about time and its relationships in the next blog. But what I'd like to do is say, look, if you take a day, a 24 hour day, and you were to map it out in a spatial relationship and say, this represents my day. What I've done here is I've put red blocks in to say this space is filled. We typically want to go to bed around 10 o'clock. Ideally, if you follow my book, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy, I don't want to get into that right now, but Let's just say we need to get by to bed by 10 so we can get up at 6 and get a solid 8 hours. So that space is occupied. Then we got to get up, brush our teeth somewhere in there. We got to shower, get dressed, and we got to eat breakfast. And somewhere along the line we have to eat lunch. So you see there's already certain spaces in our day that are occupied. We can't effectively eat lunch and lift weights or have a meeting. We can try, but it doesn't usually work very well. We can't sleep and think effectively. We can't sleep and exercise effectively. So you see each of these actually takes up 
a perceptible space in your life. And our psyche projects this, shall we say, map onto our experience. And on the inside of you, it either feels like it's open enough to allow flow or it gets constricted. So now if I say to you, well, where are you getting your space needs for happy? Hopefully you're eating breakfast. Breakfast. Hopefully you're getting sleep. Hopefully you're eating lunch. We forgot to put dinner. We'll put dinner in there. Okay, so now we know we've got a, a dinner meal in there. But then we got to say, well, where am I going to get my exercise? Well, let's just say we're going to do that in the morning before you go to work. Okay, so now we've got some movement in, but and we've got diet in, but do we need time for introspection, meditation, Tai Chi, time to be with ourselves? Well, probably, I think, you know, once you pass through um, your developmental years and you get to the point where you're really working on something meaningful in your life, which can occur anywhere from high school onward, depending on the individual, we find that we need internal space, as I've described here. But we, if we don't clarify where that's going to be, then it's probably not going to be, is my experience. So let's just say you're going to do that just before bed, okay? So now you can see that we're running out of space to do things that are, shall we say, secondary to meeting our needs. We've got to sleep, we've got to eat, we've got to move. But we also have to make money to, to pay for all these things. So, and we've got to grow ourselves professionally. Um, we've got to go out and be productive in the world. So what you'll find now is, is if you look at that and say, if that represents the space inside me that is a symbol for my day, now just connect to that and say, well, look, I've got my, my basics covered. So what happens now if Paul starts filling my day up with things and I agree to it, even though maybe I don't really want to do it? Or I'm saying um, someone asked me to do something and, I, and, that, and, and my habit is to say, yes, I'll do it, but... While I'm saying yes, on the inside, I'm saying no. There's something inside of me, and that's the, the person that's lacking space is saying no, no, no. But out of my programming, my habits, or my fears of letting someone else down, I keep saying yes. But every time I say yes when I mean no, I actually become more compressed, more emotionally charged, more reactive. So you can see, we, well, when I look at the schedules of most of the people, that need my help, that's what they look like. They have no space left to live. There's not much left for themselves. And the truth of it is, most of them have filled up all these essential spaces with activities that are not really relevant to their dream or taking care of themselves, such as watching television, gossiping, Facebook groups, uh, surfing the internet, playing video games. Now, certainly some of those are valuable, but a lot of those things at the end of the day are distractions, and in my observation, are a form of medicating oneself because they're not willing to or are not aware enough of what they need to manage in order to create an optimal space within themselves for their creativity, their thinking, and their emotions to be stable and effective in the production of their dream. Okay? So we've just covered that we have to have space to address these four doctors, the key categories of any living philosophy. Number two in my system is what needs to be balanced. What are your symptoms and what are your spatial relationships? So what symptoms are you having? And when you sit with those symptoms, I have digestive trouble. Well, a simple thing to do is, what is it that can happen in my day that I'm pretty sure is going to make my digestion and or elimination worse? For example, I've worked with many people that tell me, as long as I'm alone or have time for myself, I don't seem to have digestive trouble. But when my mother-in-law comes over, 
or too many people come over to the house and I can't get them out of the house, I feel all locked up inside. That is a somatization of your emotions. It means your, your mental emotional state physicalizes itself as above, so below. If you're crowded in the head, you're crowded in the body. If you're crowded in the heart, you're crowded in the body. So if we have too much or too little space for an effective response, then we usually have a blocking factor in our ability to feel whole inside and to create what we want in our life. And if we're in physical spaces that are limited and we don't have the finances or the ability to change those immediately or even in the short term, then when you're looking at physical spaces, you can actually look into feng shui. The author that I like is Lillian Tu. She's got some great books out there, but you can hire a feng shui expert to feng shui your office, your home, uh, or even key rooms, uh, workshops, gardens, almost anything. And my wife studied feng shui, so when we bought our house many years ago, she could restructure the whole house, which rooms had what things in them, where the water features were, what was the fire feature, the earth feature, and all the basics of feng shui. And the house, even though it's small, is, is, is really quite comfortable and doesn't feel so small. Well, it feels smaller now that Mana's been born, but it's actually a, a space that's been optimized and it's been energetically optimized. So you might even have a cubicle, and believe it or not, if you're working in a cubicle and you got a feng shui master to come help you organize the space and do the things they do with different things like mirrors and water fountains and a variety of different hanging objects, bells or chimes, you might be so blown away that that cubicle is like an oasis and you love to be there where previously it drove you nuts to have to be in there. Another thing, I've traveled the world and been in thousands of taxi cabs and some of them are nasty and they stink and the seats are all broken, but every now and then, most often it seems to be when I get a Hindu driver, they have beautiful incense in there, they have neat things on the dashboard, it's actually like you're in a temple that rolls. And I've been in some of these cabs and thought, wow, man, I could just hang out here for a while. But when you get in a dirty, nasty cab with broken this and garbage on the floor, I immediately feel that sense of compression and want to do feng shui on it, so to speak. But my point is that we always have options. We just have to be committed to creating what we want or forever suffering the side effects of poor me syndrome and blaming everybody else because our life's the shits and we don't have space in this case. So then we come down to the choices. What can you do right now? What can you plan to do? Because it's important to you and it helps you live more fully, love more fully, and be with yourself more fully, which is the actual basis of all relationships. You can't bring anything more to anyone else than you can give to yourself. And then remember, you've got to make sure that you have time to meet your four doctor needs or the biggest castle uh, won't do anything for you and you can be sitting in the most beautiful mountain range all by yourself trying to meditate and all you can think of is all the bills you got or all the unresolved relationship challenges you have. And believe me, anyone that teaches meditation can tell you that it usually takes persons about a week to 10 days in a healing space before they can get the black box to stop uh, you know flashing and dancing and wiggling and shaking and jumping and crying and vomiting and agitating other people okay so some resources my book how do you move and be healthy in particular the stress chapter because it shows you how our nervous systems develop and how we perceive stress how it's designed to protect you but how we've actually abused our natural systems and continue to do so out of ignorance. Then the one, two, three, four for overcoming addiction, obesity, and disease. That's an audio workbook program uh, that has nine hours of audio that takes you through a process of healing that you may find very helpful. Lesson one, two, and three, PPS success lesson one, how to find and live your dream helps you identify 
what are the key components of a dream, and what are the events in your life that you may be over-focusing on that are limiting, but actually could be turned into positive awareness and positive opportunity. What were the parts of your life that were uh, celebratory, you uh, enjoyed them and would like to have more of, and how do you put that into context of where you're at now relative to where you're going? And then what are the 10 components of a dream that we all have to be aware of? Because the less, the, the fewer number of those 10 components we're aware of, the more um, of an X factor we leave in every situation. Uh, lesson two is self-management, how the mind is programmed and how to use that science to reprogram yourself to be dream affirmative. Lesson three is the science of goal setting, which is effective use of time, space, and movement. PPS lesson eight is time can't be managed. That's more relevant to our uh, next lesson, but I thought I would let you know that's there now. PPS uh, lesson 11 is communication skills development because one of the problems is, is that because we're almost always involved in relationships with people, if we can't communicate our needs effectively to people, then it makes it very hard to create what we want. And if others don't feel like you're listening to them and participating in them, then you get, shall we say, um, high energy conflicts in both your personal and your uh, interior and exterior space. So that is my lesson number one here in our three-part series on space, time, movement, and healing. I will look forward to sharing lesson two with you. We will look at the issue of time. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Paul Check.